In this story, we will delve into the world of John, whose life turned upside down after he discovered his wife's infidelity. Following him through heartfelt reflections, struggles with betrayal, and the search for new meaning, we will see how each decision affects his future and the future of those he loved. John, the alarm blared its usual tune at 6 a.m., signaling the start of another day. Jessica, my wife, and I reluctantly rose from bed, greeted by the early morning light. I let out a groan, feeling the weight of fatigue as I sat up and swung my legs over the edge. What's with the dramatics? You sound like you're ancient, Jessica teased, making her way to the bathroom. After what you put me through last night, I might as well be, I retorted with a smirk, reminiscing about the evening's escapades. She certainly knew how to keep things interesting. Today marked the beginning of Jessica's business trip, leaving me to fend for myself for the week ahead. The thought didn't exactly fill me with enthusiasm. As the sound of the shower filled the room, I briefly considered joining her before deciding against it. Last night had taken its toll, and I needed a moment to recover. Jessica returned to the bedroom with an air of energy, contrasting sharply with my sluggish demeanor. Come on, sleepyhead, time to rise and shine. We've got bills to pay, she urged, miming me playfully. All right, all right, I'm getting there, I mumbled, dragging myself to the bathroom for some much-needed revitalization. Eventually, we reconvened downstairs for breakfast before parting ways, Jessica off to the airport and me to the daily grind of work. Jessica, an attorney, and I both held positions at a medium-sized manufacturing plant in St. Louis. Her expertise lay in negotiations, often traveling with teams for off-site work, such as this trip to Denver to negotiate a new subcontract with a major aerospace firm. These negotiations occurred several times a year, each trip spanning at least a week. At 35, Jessica had graduated cum laude from the State University 12 years prior. With her striking appearance, standing at 5 feet 4 inches and weighing 125 pounds, adorned with feminine attributes measuring 34-24-35, I found myself utterly enamored by her charm and allure. I'm John Baker, an engineer at the same company as my wife, aged 37. I stand at 6 feet 1 inch and maintain a weight of 165 pounds through regular workouts. Jessica and I share a passion for golf, often forming a foursome with friends. Our love story began at a company picnic, where I instantly knew she was the one for me. Evidently, the feeling was mutual as we embarked on a whirlwind courtship and tied the knot six months later. Now seven years into our marriage, we recently purchased our dream home three months ago, a place where we envisioned starting our family. Jessica planned to transition into a role as a stay-at-home mom once our children reached school age, with both sets of parents residing nearby. The anticipation of starting a family was palpable. Jessica intended to discontinue her birth control pills upon returning from this trip as we eagerly awaited the next chapter of our lives together. After breakfast, I helped Jessica load her travel bag into her car and bid her farewell with a kiss. Tears welled in her eyes as she settled into the driver's seat. Hopefully, I won't have to endure these goodbyes much longer, sweetheart. I long for the day when I won't have to travel, she lamented. I hate these goodbyes just as much as you do, honey, I reassured her. I'll see you on Friday evening, and we'll keep it simple with takeout so you can rest. Sounds good, bye, she replied before driving off. I stood in the driveway waving until her car disappeared from view, then trudged back into the house to finish my morning routine before heading to the office. Upon arrival at work, I made my way to the engineering department, grabbing a cup of coffee from the break room before settling in at my desk. Barely had I sat down when my phone rang. Baker, I answered. John, could you step into my office for a moment, came the voice on the other end. Sure, Hubert, I'll be right there, I replied, grabbing my coffee and making my way to my boss's office. As I entered, he gestured for me to take a seat. John, I've got something that might interest you. Since Jessica's away this week, I remembered you mentioning it last Friday. J. Carter, our field service engineer in California, is out sick and unable to handle a problem a customer in San Jose is facing with one of our models. Given your extensive experience with that particular model, would you be interested in heading out to San Jose to check it out? 
Well, there's not much going on here right now, and you're right, I'm flying solo this week. So when do you need me out there? Right away. Let Lucy handle your reservations and tickets, and you can give the customer a call to let them know you're on your way and to gather more details about the issue. Sounds like a plan. I'll get on it immediately, I replied, suddenly feeling a surge of enthusiasm. I'll head home, pack up, catch a flight out this afternoon, and be at the customer's location by tomorrow morning. Great, safe travels, Hubert replied, signaling the end of our conversation. I made a quick stop at Lucy's desk, briefing her on the flights and reservations I needed, before heading to my own desk to call the customer and clarify their issue. With that done, I eagerly left for home to pack. A grin crept across my face as I drove, a plan forming in my mind. If I wrap things up swiftly, I could surprise Jessica with a detour to Denver on my way back. The thought of spending a couple of unexpected days with her in Denver only fueled my excitement. At the airport while waiting for my flight, I tried calling Jessica's cell phone, but she didn't answer. I left her a voicemail informing her that I'd be staying with my folks for a couple of days and to reach me on my cell in the evenings. Everything proceeded smoothly. By Tuesday afternoon, I had resolved the customer's issue and had their equipment up and running satisfactorily. Afterward, I swiftly arranged a flight to Denver, scheduled to land at 9 p.m. Mountain Time. Checking out of my San Jose hotel, I made my way to San Francisco airport where I enjoyed dinner before my flight. During dinner, Jessica called my cell, and we exchanged a brief conversation. She inquired about my folks, and I responded as though I were with them. Jessica mentioned that negotiations were progressing but expressed her fatigue, planning to spend a quiet evening in her hotel room. After exchanging expressions of love, we bid farewell. Boarding my flight after dinner, I arrived at Jessica's suite hotel around 9.45 p.m. After confirming my identity, the hotel staff provided me with a key card for her suite. Entering her room quietly, I noticed a lamp illuminated over the computer table with her laptop closed. However, Jessica was nowhere to be found. Perplexed, I sat down my suitcase and checked the bedroom and bathroom, both of which were empty. I shrugged off the initial confusion, assuming Jessica hadn't returned to her room yet. I debated whether to wait or to check the lounge for her whereabouts. However, my attention was drawn to the slightly ajar door of the adjoining room. Approaching cautiously, the door swung open silently. Peering into the living room of the adjacent suite, I found it empty. Intrigued, I stepped inside, only to be startled by a sudden groan emanating from the bedroom. My stomach churned, and a cold sweat broke out as I tiptoed toward the bedroom door. My breath caught in my throat as I beheld the scene before me. In the dimly lit room, there stood Jessica, completely nude, while an unidentified man lay on the bed, his face obscured from view. My initial instinct was to storm in and confront Jessica, to unleash my fury upon the man lying on the bed. Yet rationality prevailed over the surge of emotions, and I slowly retreated from the door, returning to Jessica's suite. Retrieving the digital camera I had brought along for capturing souvenirs, I recalibrated it for dim lighting and disabled the flash. With a composed demeanor, I approached the other bedroom door. Standing quietly, I discreetly captured several images of the scene unfolding on the bed, ensuring neither of them noticed my presence. Their obliviousness to their surroundings, consumed by their actions, allowed me to document the betrayal before me. Before departing Jessica's suite, I rifled through the open briefcase on the table and discovered a business card belonging to David Price, the chief negotiator for our company. I pocketed the card for future reference. Back in her suite, I connected my camera to her laptop using the camera-slash-computer interface cable I always carried with our laptops, sharing the same photo program. Transferring a picture from my camera to hers was a straightforward task. I set up the incriminating image as her desktop background before repacking my camera into my travel bag and silently exiting her suite. Struggling to contain my emotions, I fought back tears as I made my way to the elevator, the weight of betrayal heavy upon me. After returning the entry card to the front desk, I promptly contacted the airline to inquire about the next available flight back to St. Louis. Fortunately, there was a 6.30 a.m. flight that would have me home by 9.30 a.m. 
I calculated that this would coincide with the time Jessica typically opened her laptop at the negotiating table. It would serve as the moment she realized she had been caught, signaling the end of our marriage. I then made my way back to the airport and checked into a nearby motel. Despite my restless state, I couldn't bring myself to sleep. Instead, I replayed the distressing scene from Jessica's hotel room over and over in my mind, allowing myself to release my pent-up anguish through tears. By the time I left the motel at 5 a.m., I had cried myself empty, and my resolve was clear, to swiftly bring our marriage to an end upon my return to St. Louis. My phone began to ring as I got into my car. Glancing at the caller ID, I saw it was Jessica. Choosing to ignore the call, I turned off my phone and proceeded home. As I entered the house, the landline began to ring. A quick glance at the caller ID confirmed it was Jessica again. Opting to let it go to the answering machine, I listened silently as her tearful plea echoed through the room, John, please call me right away. I need to talk to you, honey, it's important. Ignoring Jessica's tearful pleas, I headed upstairs to change my clothes before going out to rent a U-Haul. Returning home, I swiftly began packing, aiming to vacate the house by the time Jessica arrived around 4 p.m. Within a couple of hours, I managed to relocate all my personal belongings to a rental storage unit. Prior to packing, I scheduled an appointment with our lawyer for that afternoon to initiate divorce proceedings. After unloading my belongings at the storage unit, I proceeded to the lawyer's office and requested immediate action to commence the divorce process. Though tempted to cite adultery as grounds, I opted for irreconcilable differences, reserving the former in case of a contentious divorce. Additionally, I instructed the lawyer to update my will, naming my brother as the sole beneficiary. Stopping at the bank, I transferred half of our savings and checking balances to new accounts solely in my name. I then contacted Ed, my investment advisor, to execute similar actions on our joint investment accounts. With a heavy heart, I drove to my parents' house, suitcase in hand, and entered through the open door. Upon seeing me, my mother exclaimed in surprise, John, where have you been? Jessica has been calling here several times looking for you. Did you tell her you were staying here? Sitting down with my retired father, I explained the situation. They were shocked to hear about Jessica's infidelity and the impending end of our marriage. Seeking refuge, I asked if I could stay with them temporarily until I found a furnished apartment, to which they readily agreed. It seemed my estimation was quite accurate, as around 6 p.m., just as we were settling down for dinner, the doorbell chimed. My father rose to answer it, returning moments later with a visibly distressed Jessica trailing behind him. John, why haven't you been answering my calls? I needed to talk to you. You've moved all your belongings out of the house, she exclaimed, her voice trembling. I would think the message I left you on your desktop would have provided all the information you needed, I replied calmly. Oh God, I was so afraid it was you. Can we please go somewhere and talk, sweetheart? Jessica pleaded. Jessica, I'm no longer your sweetheart, and there's nothing left for us to discuss. I've already initiated divorce proceedings, and anything that needs to be communicated can be handled through our lawyers. What I witnessed in Denver has shattered any feelings I had for you, and I need you to leave so I can finish my dinner, I stated firmly. Please, John, don't do this without talking to me, she implored desperately. What could you possibly say to justify your infidelity? It certainly wasn't an act of violence like the one I witnessed and have evidence of, I retorted, my tone unwavering. You better call your lover, David, and inform him that I'll be dealing with him tomorrow. Perhaps his wife will have a different perspective on the matter than I do. Oh God, can't we talk, please, John? Jessica pleaded, her voice trembling. Please go, Jessica. My dinner is getting cold, I replied firmly. But I'll offer you this, why don't you take some time to write me a nice, long letter explaining how you rationalize breaking your wedding vows. I'm sure a lawyer as smart as you can articulate how it was all my fault and how you can still love and respect me very much. With a sob, Jessica turned away, but before she reached the door, she turned back to me. Please, John, don't end our marriage without talking to me. Goodbye, Jessica, I said, my tone resolute. After she left, 
still in tears, my parents remained seated, stunned by the exchange. That was awfully harsh, John, my mother remarked. Mom, do you want to see the pictures I have of her and her lover? That's what's harsh, I replied bluntly. She completely disrespected me, and I can't live with that, nor can I ever trust her again. I understand, son, my father finally spoke up. Maybe if things calm down a little, you might see things differently. I don't think so, dad. Let's talk about something else so I can finish my meal, I said, eager to change the subject. Okay, son, my father agreed reluctantly. As I left home that Monday morning, a pang of sadness washed over me at the thought of leaving John behind. However, I couldn't help but feel excited about the prospect of starting a family together once I returned. We had waited patiently, ensuring that we were financially and professionally prepared to embark on this new chapter of our lives. Now, everything seemed to be falling into place. The journey to Denver passed without incident. I found myself seated beside David Price, our chief negotiator, with whom I shared a comfortable rapport. We briefly discussed the upcoming negotiations before delving into more personal topics, such as our families. David was aware of my plans to quit work upon becoming pregnant, and he expressed his sentiments about missing me once I took on the role of a full-time mother. At 48 and married for two decades with children in high school, David and I had formed a strong negotiating team long before my marriage. Our camaraderie was evident, and we were accustomed to each other's company. Meanwhile, the other two members of our team engaged in their own conversations behind us. Upon arrival at the hotel in Denver, David and I checked into our respective rooms, which were conveniently adjoining. This arrangement had initially been made to facilitate late-night meetings on negotiation strategies. However, about 10 years ago, our relationship took a different turn, and we convinced ourselves that engaging in intimacy was merely a means of relieving stress after a demanding day of negotiations. At the time, we rationalized that it wasn't considered cheating on his wife if it contributed to our professional success. Occasionally, we even joked about it. After John and I had been married for a couple of years, I began to feel uneasy about our intimate interactions with David, and we eventually stopped engaging in them. However, during a particularly stressful negotiation, David proposed reconsidering our arrangement to ease tension. With some hesitation, I agreed, and before I knew it, I found myself pulled back into the situation. The thrill of the forbidden and the potential consequences added an intensity to my emotions at home, which also seemed to have a positive effect on John, alleviating any concerns I may have had. During this trip, we didn't connect on the first night as I felt tired after dinner. However, after a demanding day of negotiations, I agreed to meet with David the following evening. I'm unsure of how or when John discovered the truth or how he obtained the incriminating picture, but the following morning, when I opened my laptop, I was stunned into paralysis by what was displayed on the screen. David, seated beside me, reacted swiftly, slamming the lid shut and requesting a brief recess from the negotiations. We retreated to the hallway where his anger was palpable. What's that mess on your desktop, he inquired. I have no idea, David. It wasn't there the last time I used it, I replied, still taken aback. Let me take a look, he said. I reopened the laptop, and we examined the image together. Oh no, that's you, he exclaimed. Me? How is that possible? I'm not sure, but it's definitely you, and that figure beneath you is probably me, although my face is invisible. Did you leave your laptop unattended at any point yesterday? No. It was with me during the trip and in my suite while I was visiting yours. Could someone have accessed your room with a camera? I doubt it. The door was closed, and I assumed it was locked. You need to return to the hotel and check if anyone was given access to your room last night. I'll handle things here. Try to contact John and find out his whereabouts last night. It couldn't have been him, I spoke with him at his parents' house last night. Did you call him on his parents' phone? No, he requested that I call his cell phone. Uh-oh, that's concerning. He could have been anywhere. When you talk to him, call me on my cell if you discover anything. Do whatever you can to mitigate this situation. Take a cab back to the hotel, okay? Bye. 
I was drenched in sweat. If John was behind that picture on my laptop, it seemed like a clear message that our marriage was over. I needed to return to the hotel and gather more information. The receptionist hailed a cab for me, and within 15 minutes, I was back at the hotel. I headed straight to the front desk to inquire if anyone had accessed my suite. After checking the computer records, the clerk informed me that a Mr. John Baker had been issued a card at 9.45 the previous evening, which was returned half an hour later. It was then that the sinking realization hit me, my marriage was likely at its end. The man I cherished more than anything had vanished. But I resolved to fight to win him back. Ascending to my site, I immediately tried calling John on his cell and at his workplace. His cell was switched off, but I left an urgent voicemail stressing the importance of him contacting me as soon as possible. His secretary revealed that he was away on business in California and expected to return tomorrow. So he had gone to California, and perhaps stopped by on his way back to surprise me. It seemed we were both in for a surprise. Contacting his parents, they informed me they hadn't seen him for several days. I urged them to have him call me as soon as they reached him. Calling our home yielded no response, but I left a message there too, hoping he would get in touch soon. I sat alone in the suite, tears streaming down my face, without a way to reach him except by returning home. I grabbed the phone and hastily made reservations for the next flight to St. Louis. After packing my belongings, I dialed David's number on my cell and relayed the latest developments. There was a pause before he spoke. Jessica, I fear we're both staring down the barrel of divorce or even worse. What could that possibly be? Our company strictly prohibits relationships between employees at the managerial level. If this gets out, we could both be looking at termination. It wouldn't bode well for our careers. Oh my goodness, I should have realized. But losing John feels like the end of the world to me. Losing my family would be devastating too. But your priority now is to return to St. Louis and try to reason with John, see if you can salvage the situation. I've already booked a flight departing at noon. I should be back in St. Louis by 4.30. I need to find him and have a conversation. I'll keep you posted on how it unfolds. I'll have to remain here until the negotiations are concluded. I'll be eagerly awaiting your update. With our farewells exchanged, we hung up. Gathering my bag and laptop, I hastened down to the lobby, checked out, and utilized the hotel's limo service to reach the airport. Throughout the journey back to St. Louis, I prayed fervently, hoping to engage John in a conversation. I needed to clarify that it was just a physical encounter and held no emotional significance. I staked everything on the possibility that he could approach my infidelity rationally and accept it as nothing more than a meaningless act. Upon my return home, nothing seemed amiss initially. However, upon entering our bedroom, the absence of his clothes and personal belongings struck me. It was evident he knew and had left me. I had to locate him. After numerous unsuccessful phone calls, I resolved to visit his parents' house to ascertain his whereabouts or glean any insights they might have. Encountering him at his parents' place was gut-wrenching. His coldness and detachment were almost physically sickening. He delivered the news of his intention to file for divorce with a brutal lack of empathy, stating unequivocally that he had no interest in conversing with me, adamant that nothing I could say would alter his decision. His suggestion to write a lengthy letter detailing my perspective felt like a final twist of the knife. Before I excused myself and retreated to my car, where I succumbed to tears. The future we had envisioned together crumbled before my eyes. The family we had dreamed of building would never materialize. We would never share the joys of growing old together or revel in the delights of grandchildren. Amidst my personal despair, a selfish fear gnawed at me, the prospect that by the time I found another partner, I might be too old to conceive. Eventually, I mustered the strength to start the car and drive back to our now desolate home, engulfed by a profound sense of loss and uncertainty. John, after a fitful night filled with unsettling visions of Jessica and David intertwined, I rose early and made my way downstairs in my parents' home to brew some coffee. With a heavy heart, I retrieved my laptop and camera, determined to sift through the images stored in the camera. My mind fixated on the need to identify David in those pictures somehow. 
As I scrolled through the images, David's face remained frustratingly indistinct. However, my perseverance paid off when I noticed a detail on his right arm as it reached towards Jessica's chest. Zooming in, I discerned what I was searching for, a tattoo. Further enlargement revealed it to be a heart with the name Janet inscribed within it. Janet was David's wife. With this damning evidence in hand, I returned upstairs, showered, and prepared for work. When I descended again, my mother was already bustling about preparing breakfast. At work, I wasted no time. I burned a couple of CDs containing the incriminating photos and a blown-up image of David's tattoo. Additionally, I printed several sets and assembled them all into a folder. With resolve coursing through me, I strode to the Human Resources Department and requested to see the manager, Chad. We were acquainted, having crossed paths in our relatively small company and even shared a round of golf together. Placing a set of pictures from my folder in front of him, I awaited his reaction. What's this, John? Pornographic pictures. Chad's expression was a mix of curiosity and amusement. Sorry, Chad. They may seem explicit, but that's my wife and David Price. As you can see from the date and time stamps, they were taken Tuesday evening in David's hotel suite in Denver. They were there for a negotiation trip on behalf of the company. Oh, damn, John. I'm sorry to hear that. What do you want to do about it? You can terminate both of them for cause under the anti-fraternization clause in their contracts with the company. We've never enforced that before. Are you certain you want to proceed? It'll expose this affair to everyone. And does this mean you're pursuing a divorce for Jessica? I've already instructed my lawyer to start drafting the papers. But if you choose not to act on this, I'll have no choice but to take legal action against the company. Okay, John. I'll bring this to our legal department and initiate the process. Afterward, I went to speak with my boss, Hubert, to update him on the tumult in my personal life. He reacted appropriately, expressing shock and concern at the revelation regarding my wife and David Price. When I requested the remainder of the week off as vacation time, he readily granted it. Before parting ways, he commended me for a job well done during my trip to California. He relayed positive feedback from the customer, praising my swift resolution of their issue and the prompt restoration of their production line. Additionally, he floated the idea of me taking over the California territory as the current field engineer was retiring due to health reasons. I promised to give it consideration and provide him with my decision upon my return to work the following week. As I exited Hubert's office, his secretary Lucy intercepted me. John, your wife was here looking for you. She mentioned she would return later. Lucy, under no circumstances do I want to see my wife. Please convey this to her when she returns. Oh, John, I'm so sorry. I had no idea there was an issue. There's a big problem, Lucy. We're getting divorced. She and David Price have been involved. I anticipated that word would spread throughout the plant by noon. Lucy had a penchant for gossip. Returning to my desk, I dialed Janet Price, David's wife. Although we had crossed paths at company picnics, I knew that my revelations about our spouses could weigh heavily on her. Janet, it's John Baker. How are you? John! David mentioned you might be getting in touch, but he didn't say why. Janet, we need to talk as soon as possible. Of course, John. Can you come over now? I have a hair appointment at 1 o'clock this afternoon, but I'm free at the moment. Do you still reside on Elm Street? Yes, that's right. All right, I know where you live. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Arriving at the prices, a sense of apprehension washed over me as I contemplated the task ahead. I knew I couldn't let David evade the consequences, leaving Jessica to bear the brunt alone. Hi, John. Come on in. Would you like some coffee? I just brewed a fresh pot, Janet offered, gesturing towards the living room. That would be great, Janet. Just black, please. Returning shortly with the coffee, she settled into a chair opposite me. Now, what's this about, she inquired. 
I briefly entertained the idea of delivering the news gently but ultimately opted for a direct approach, eager to get it over with. Janet, I have to tell you something difficult. I caught your husband and my wife together in Denver, and I'm in the process of divorcing Jessica and having them both terminated from their jobs. I hate to be the bearer of such news, but it's going to become public knowledge soon, and I wanted to prepare you. I have photographic evidence to support what I'm saying if you want to see. I observed her closely, trying to gauge her reaction, but was taken aback by her lack of visible emotion. John, I suppose I've had my suspicions about David's behavior during his business trips for some time now, although I always hoped they weren't true. David has always been a loving husband and father, and I didn't want to confront the possibility. But I realized that eventually something would come to light, exposing their affair. I suppose this is it. I'm truly sorry for what you're going through with your marriage, and from my own perspective, I'm sorry for the potential consequences for David. He's reaching an age where finding another job with comparable pay could prove challenging. Now I have to figure out what to do next. Would you like a set of the photographs I have? I offered. Yes, please leave them. I'll gather the courage to look at them, Janet replied quietly. I'm truly sorry, Janet. I couldn't let this slide. Jessica and I were on the brink of starting a family, but I can't build a future with someone I can't trust or respect. The mother of our children needs both of those qualities, I explained, my voice heavy with sorrow. I understand, John. Thank you for being honest with me. I wouldn't want to hear about it from anyone else first. And let me reiterate how sorry I am about what you're going through with Jessica. I'm sure she's just as devastated and regretful as David will be when he discovers that I'm aware of his affair. I only wish it were a one-time mistake, it would be easier to forgive. But I fear it's been ongoing for years, and that's a bitter pill to swallow. Now that it's out in the open, I have my pride, and I need to hold my head up high, Janet expressed, her voice tinged with a mixture of sadness and resolve. If there's anything I can do to help, please don't hesitate to let me know, I offered sincerely as I prepared to leave and make my way back to my parents' house. It's been half a year since I initiated the divorce proceedings. This morning, I received the finalized agreement officially ending my marriage to Jessica. I hadn't spoken to her or laid eyes on her since the day she visited my parents' house. My lawyer handled everything in the settlement. I relinquished the heavily mortgaged house along with its financed furniture and furnishings to sever all ties with her. Additionally, I had my name removed from the mortgage, leaving her solely responsible for the payments. Without a steady income, she had no choice but to put the house up for sale, ultimately taking a significant financial hit in the process. Initially, she attempted to contest the divorce but I issued an ultimatum, either sign the papers within 48 hours, or I would amend the grounds for divorce to adultery and release the incriminating pictures of her and David online. Under pressure, she acquiesced within the stipulated time frame, and that's why I'm a free man today. It seems she decided that she didn't want me badly enough after all. Although she lost her job as a consequence, Jessica, being a shrewd lawyer and negotiator, managed to secure a new position within a month. It may not offer the same salary or benefits as her previous role, but here she's managing to get by and has even started dating again. Best of luck to her new boyfriend, whoever he may be. I can't help but wonder if she's disclosed the details of our divorce and the reasons behind it to him. Perhaps I should enlighten him myself. Janet divorced David and left him financially drained. Despite being terminated from his job, he managed to find new employment. However, his current salary makes it challenging for him to meet his alimony and child support obligations. As for me, I've settled in Santa Maria, California, a serene coastal town halfway between the Bay Area and Los Angeles. I made the move about four months ago and now reside in an apartment complex filled with singles and young couples, many of whom are saving up for a homeownership payment. Housing prices in this area are steep, making entry into the market quite costly. I've also found companionship with a woman in the same complex. Like me, she's divorced, but we've found comfort and compatibility in each other's company. We're taking things one step at a time, exploring the possibility of a future together. 
Given my frequent travel schedule, trust is paramount in any potential relationship, especially if we're considering starting a family. The ticking of biological clocks serves as a reminder that time waits for no one, prompting me to consider making a move sooner rather than later.